Cyan and Lee, thanks for having me. We're in an undisclosed place in San Francisco, the home of all things free, yeah. home of the brave. Yes. Um, <laughs> and this this particular episode is super exciting for me because the, the, the very reason we're all sitting here was sort of the spontaneous emergence of a protest movement and, and sort of what the left would call a direct action against the, the it, Chinese government. It was very grassroots. Yeah. yeah. I haven't done activism for a while, so it's kind of cool to be back in the game. But let's introduce you guys. Um, Lee Bishop, we were talking earlier. We, we have known each other just for a little while online. Mm -hmm. And I feel like now um, that I meet you, we can, we can call ourselves sort of cyber friends. Absolutely. Yeah. Or in-person <laughs> friends. Yeah. It's official. Well, we're going to be seeing more of each other. Yeah. And you are a um, liberty <laughs> activist who has taken a, a not direct route to where you are today. Give us a little bit of background. My history is a little circuitous. Um, so I've been multiple things that are probably not all that appreciated in the San Francisco area. <laughs> so I've been a gun dealer um, more recently before I left Arkansas. Uh, I'm originally from Arkansas. Um, I was a professional woodworker making duck calls and then I decided to go back to school. And that was after living in the woods for over a year. So as, you're saying that gun man. dealing and duck calls are not a San Francisco thing? Um, I, you know, I- They ought to be. <laughs> they ought to be. <laughs> they That'll some, be our next project. I have yeah. plenty of ducks around here. So it'd be really good hunting like in Marin County. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it seems to be that a lot of people here are kind of against hunting and both, both guns. Yeah. So. But you're, you're, I'll call you a liberty activist who just causes trouble. Okay. Or polemicist. Yeah. Whatever works. Okay. What's that mean? A shit stirrer. Well, oh, okay. Shit stirrer. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's a big word that? for, can, can we say shit? Sure. Okay. All right. Cool. <laughs> Fuck yeah. Right. Fuck yeah. <laughs> um, Cyan, we've known each other longer. And yep. we've been involved in all sorts of projects over the years, but but tell tell everybody a little bit about you. Sure, um, I'm a venture capitalist and I'm an investor. Um, I came up through this through a very sort of untraditional route. You know, I'm from the punk rock world as a teenager. Uh, was homeless as a teen. Uh, basically, got into technology and became a self-taught engineer. And uh, that led me from one job to another and eventually, oddly enough, to investing. It's not something that I ever thought I would be doing as a teenager. And um, I identify as libertarian and that shocks a lot of people because when they see me, they don't expect that. Uh, and so I get a lot of questions about it. And partially, I am, you know, I'm from Arizona. It kind of like is in our water there. Mm -hmm. um, but the other thing is that you know I had a, I had a boyfriend who got Reason Magazine and Propaganda in the mail, and, and I started reading it, and I was like, oh, this might be who I am. That's interesting, because um, I think there's a lot of people out there who are libertarian, uh, freedom-oriented people, but just don't know it yet. I call them the liberty curious. Yes. Because yes. they, can't, they can't identify with either the right or the left, but they're not sure where to go. Yep. Yep. And you're one of those guys. Yes, I or was. you were. And, I but was, now you're, Absolutely. Um, I was very liberty curious and yeah. it's interesting because my husband and I, um, we met at a company corporate function. I don't know if you know this or not, but, um, we were playing uh, poker and he started asking me like all these funny libertarian questions to see if we were compatible. Mm -hmm. He was like, uh, how do you feel about smoking in a private establishment? You know? <laughs> and so, um, that's how we, uh, got to know that we were aligned ideologically and, um, but yeah. So, so you're you're um, um, you're an angel investor, right? Correct, and, that... and a venture investor. Okay, I do both. Tell tell me the uninitiated the, the difference. I understand angel a little bit, but what's the difference between one and the other? Yeah, so one is investing your own capital, and the other is investing other people's capital. So I invest um, money of basically my family's money into high risk startups <laughs> that may go to zero. And then um, I also invest other people's money in very similar situations um, on behalf of Founders Fund, um, which is a venture firm here in San Francisco. And, and that's, um, that's Peter Thiel's gig, right? Correct. One yeah. of his gigs. One of his gigs. Um, yeah. He has a lot of different funds, but we're one of them. Um, we're part of the Thiel family. And um, so we have what's called a limited partner and limited partners basically give us capital to invest on their behalf. And then we get upside when we perform well. I feel like liberty itself is very much, should be an angel thing because it could zero out 
at any That's true. on any particular project, That's or true. it could become a big thing. Yep. Which leads us to the topic at hand. Um, I think you, Cyan, tweeted something out that Lee had tweeted out, and he he was he was all pissed off about uh, about the NBA kicking activists out of games for 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 just holding up signs. I think they said free Hong Kong or something equivalent to that. Yeah, some of the preseason games, yeah. they were doing that. Mm-hmm. And it was before LeBron James said the dumb thing that he said, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, but, but tell, the, tell this origin story, because this is, this is how technology can lead where, to good things. Where were we when you told me about this? I don't even remember. Well, my idea for the shirt was after we watched The Joker, and we were walking back to the house. And then this was after all the news going on, kicking off about how the NBA had deleted or pressured Daryl Morey to delete his tweet yeah. supporting Hong Kong. Um, and they had overseas trips and everything and the whole commotion about we're overseas having exhibition games in China because it's a huge market and we want to get into China. And they were eventually uh, virtually silencing Daryl Morey and his opinion, right? Um, and so that's an American company that enjoys the liberties and freedoms and establishment here in the U.S. has become very wealthy from doing that. And then you would expect reasonably that they would be standing up for American values and freedoms and liberties uh, and trying to propagate that around the world so other people can be free, right? That's not what we were saying. Um, So it just aggravated me to no end and I had been stewing on it for days and we saw the Joker. And you know, the theme of the Joker is he had enough. (laughs) He kind (laughs) of had enough. Um, and so after we saw the movie, but we yeah. believe in nonviolent protests. Nonviolent to be clear. Yes, protests. Nonviolent yes. protests. We're not going to show up to any TV shows. Um, Although show. De Niro sort of had it coming. I, he I was kind of a prick. Yeah. Can, I, <laughs> a prick. can I say that on camera? I just did. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, we had just seen that, and I just we're standing. We were standing outside your house, and I said, you know, I've been thinking we should just print off a bunch of shirts and hand them out at an NBA game at the Warriors game, and just force the NBA to broadcast support for Hong Kong. Yeah. Um, and so she said it was a great idea. And so I just went straight home and started to go fund me. And then we started tweeting that and getting support from the local community, some of the Hong Kong uh, supporters, um, and just created a little grassroots um, movement kind of with over 100, like 120 volunteers or so. Yeah. And just support from all across the globe. Um, we had yeah, the people first from Hong hours, Kong. It was like crazy. Yeah, it was crazy. Like, and then we had people from Hong Kong thanking us constantly for weeks and weeks of, of supporting and standing, standing up for them. Yeah. So it just grew from there. So you set up the GoFundMe. Oh, he did. You I set did. up the yeah. GoFundMe. I just encouraged it. I, I, sent, <laughs> I sent 50 bucks, which, and then Lee reached out to me, and then we all started talking, and somewhere along the way we said we should document this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, not just because it's a cool project, but I think that the entire strategy of shedding light and translating um, something that's far away. Very few Americans have ever been to Hong Kong. They, they don't necessarily know the history between mainland China and Hong Kong, but um, we, could, we could sort of illuminate that because the values that they're fighting for are human values. They're, yeah. they're what I would call quintessentially American values. Mm-hmm. And that, that to me is the, the strategy, get people to notice. Yeah, because I mean, it's not just America to where we should have human rights and free self-determination and freedom from oppressive government. And if we are doing business with, with an area like Hong Kong, and Hong Kong enjoys a special freedom uh, with US trade, a trade relationship, which China, mainland China, depends on, because that's the financial hub. So all these financial trans- transactions go through Hong Kong to go to mainland China, just so they can avoid some of the restrictions on trade. Yeah. So it's absolutely crucial. It's a, a wonderful place to have this sort of protest against China, yeah. because China is kind of, it to some degree has their hands tied behind their back. So. I also, yeah, I have a personal affinity for Hong Kong. I worked there for a little while. And that's also part of why it resonated so much with me was yeah. firsthand experience working in Hong Kong and um, seeing how nervous even then, this was like nine, 2000, well, probably 2001 actually, uh, where they were really, really nervous about what the future held for them and what that meant for their freedoms. And there was already talk then about what uh, sort of free speech rights they would lose in the future. And, uh, you know, they've been on edge for a while. This is not something that happened overnight. Yeah. You know, it's been brewing for quite some time. And so I think a lot of people, it really frustrates me because they see these videos of people waving our flag and singing our national anthem. 
and saying, you know, we need a First Amendment, we need a Second Amendment, we need a Fourth Amendment. Yeah. And I'm like, wow, these people are more American than a lot of people here <laughs> when it comes to understanding what makes America so special. And um, I don't know how you can watch that and not want to do something. No, because, I mean, we are absolutely lucky to have the freedoms that we have. And to see other people yearning for that and then seeing Americans here taking essentially our freedoms for granted, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, not really appreciating wanting to limit speech because it hurts someone's feeling. Yeah. Um, and then we see these people just yearning for that sort of freedom. Uh, so it's really, you know, just heartening. My favorite meme is uh, be the Americans that Hong Kongers think you are. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Because it, but it, yes. there, there is something precious about um, freedom newly discovered. And I, I definitely feel this. I, I would, Terry and I were just in Tbilisi, Georgia speaking, and like over a thousand kids showed up because. Russia is right over the mountains and has been messing with them um, since uh, the, the, the uh, Soviet Union collapsed. And so young people there understand a little bit about what freedom's like in a very visceral way. They have somebody that was, that was killed by the, the Soviet government. Um, I, think, I think Hong Kongers are the same way. They, they appreciate what's at stake here. Mm -hmm. We're, um, one of my Venezuelan friends, um, calls all of our American problems uh, full belly problems because we don't really have to worry about whether or not the government is going to starve us to death. Um, but, but these things, these erode. You said earlier, boiling a frog. Like these, these liberties erode quite quickly. A little bit by bit. Exactly. One, one progressive actually said, I won't quote him by name, he's like, he's like, looking at Hong Kong, I now guess I understand what the Second Amendment is really all about. Yes, yeah. yes. I, we were joking, but not joking, that it would be really great to go and, and, and arm Taiwan um, <laughs> and all of the people of Taiwan. And or just have the U.S. military take over a port, you know, yeah. if we could. Yeah. Um, maybe Hong Kong could become a 51st state or something. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, they, they realize it themselves. You know, I've started seeing signs. It's like, we need a Second Amendment. They know that they're outgunned and outnumbered and... Um, the only thing that they can fight with are their words and, you know, refusal to work in protesting. And that's really all they've got. And just shutting down the city to where it can't operate. Yeah. Yeah. Because, I mean, you have one-seventh of the island just shutting down, just blocking the streets. You've got a, what's the population of Hong Kong? Around 8 million or so? 7 million? I think it's like 7 million. Yeah. And so then you have over a million people in the streets on these protest days. One-seventh of the population. Just shutting I mean, down the city. that's pretty intense. Yeah. Imagine if that happened here. Yeah. Yeah, imagine. <laughs> and so if you have that many people showing up, the, the support, and you saw this in the, in the recent election, like um, vast majority of the people in Hong Kong, unless, unless they're, they're literally in bed with the Chinese government, are mm -hmm. for the protesters. Just most people don't have the courage to risk their lives and, and go out. But they kind of don't have an excuse after these protests for five, five or six months. Yeah. So when, we recently, when they recently had those elections, uh, for the city council, they took over 17 out of the 18 districts in the city. Yeah. So they had 76 or 77 percent of the vote, which they had a minority the last time they voted. The last time it was more majority share of um, the supporters of the Beijing. Yeah. So. And then we we talk to people from there, and they say, well, you know, it's more symbolic than anything because it, the elections are a sham, and and they don't really have much power. Um, so. But it also kind of arms the pro-democracy crowd, too, because you'd constantly heard propaganda from mainland China saying, oh, well, that's a minority sort of thing. We have mm -hmm. a silent majority supporting Beijing. Right. And then you have this vote that totally proves otherwise. And yeah. so now the government doesn't know what to do. They don't know what to do. You have Carrie Lam. She's like, I don't know. City's broken. Right. What do you want me to do, Beijing? Yeah. Well, so. this is the power of, of technology and video and the fact that... that um, uh, millions and millions and millions of people all over the world are paying attention to this mm -hmm. in a way that never, ever happened during Tiananmen, Tian Tiananmen Square. Um, I mean, if this happened people's... on mainland, we wouldn't be hearing this. Right. Because of the Great Wall of China. Yeah. The, the cyber firewall. firewall the great whatever cyber they call firewall. It. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, but Hong Kong has that luxury to be able to get their message out to the to world. I mean, just recently we also saw Iran to where they shut down the internet. So they're lucky to be able to get that, that word out. Um, if it were in mainland, we might not hear as much at all. Yeah. 
So we, we, we released this video yesterday, and I'm, I'm playing with the time-space continuum here because it's actually before we released the video, but uh, by the, when it airs next week, the video will be out. And we, we capture um, the entire direct action thing of handing out T-shirts, and, and you, got, you got your message on live TV, and you did everything that the NBA didn't want you to do, and you certainly did everything that China didn't want you to do. Um, what's your what's your diagnosis of of, of the action, and, and what do you think comes next? Well, we had spoken about a couple things. I mean, first of all, just to recap, we ended up handing we raised over twenty five thousand dollars for shirts. Uh, we handed out over four thousand uh, at two different games, and there was a little bit of support from within the NBA organization, um, but. I don't know. I, I feel that we were successful in getting our message across, especially that second game that Cyan was able to go to, um, yeah. which she bravely, <laughs> unapologetically wore for your Hong Kong shirt on live on broadcast court. on the court side in yeah. front of the players. Um, yeah, which, that's, which that's the one that kept showing up. Yeah, interestingly, the uh, uh, so when you buy courtside tickets, it comes with this like special lounge event that you can go to mm -hmm. in the, the background, and it's where all of the like quote unquote VIPs go and have snacks and drinks or whatever. And um, we walked in, uh, it was Drew uh, Curtis who runs FARC.com. We walked in and he also works at Reddit. Um, and everyone stopped and looked at our shirts. And there was a bunch of nods and a lot of sort of like grins. Um, and what was really interesting is we had like top notch VIP service from all of the people working there. Like constantly like, do you need anything to drink? Do you need anything to eat? Hmm. And then finally someone whispered like, in our ears, like they were like, we really like your shirts. And I was like, wow, like this is awesome. People are actually really excited about this. And we had people who um, came up to us and asked how they could get the shirt. We also, uh, around, we realized at one point that in order for our, TV, our, our shirts to show up on television, we needed to turn them around. Um, and so we went to the bathroom, turned our shirts around and a bunch of people <coughs> noticed and thought that the arena had asked us to turn our shirts inside out. And so they were really concerned and about to do something about it. Yeah. And we're like, no, no, no. It's just so that we can end up on the uh, on the TV screen. Yeah. You know, because as they they pan the camera across, they can't miss us. If, and so we would stand up every moment we could, cheer and stand. We did so that you could just see it every single time. Um, and there was no escaping it. It was fantastic. And what we realized is we could we could definitely. It, it was an interesting marketing exercise of nothing else because we figured out we can. We actually only need about forty shirts. Yeah. So, <laughs> so basically, our future <laughs> plans, our basically our future plans, would just be handing out to a smaller group, probably around the court side. Yeah, find people that have the yeah. right uh, high visibility marketing, high visibility. Because it turns out uh, the folks there were not afraid to wear the shirts. Yeah. We thought they would be, but they weren't. And, and after they saw she and Drew on this on the court side, then people even in the stands started Start wearing putting their shirts, their shirts on because yeah. they're just like, well, we're not going to get kicked out. They're not going right. to. They're not getting kicked out. So. Um, but we got high fives and, and uh, people were pretty excited about it. So you can make a difference um, with shirts. And um, I think that people had to stop and think about what the NBA was doing, um, how this impacts people. And, you know, I also think that, um, you know, getting on television sent a message to Hong Kong. Like we got people in Hong Kong who saw it. Yeah. And they said, thank you so much for standing with us because that was our goal. Yeah. Uh, it's not for ourselves, it's just so that we can get that message out there. And people who are watching it at home actually tagged it as well. And they were like, I can't believe this, but I'm seeing free Hong Kong shirts right there on the court. So, um, But it also, it, it creates like copycats. And, and this is always true with, with grassroots activism. And it, it certainly was true in Hong Kong. It started small. Mm -hmm. and, it, and we're one of many of these movements. Yeah. We're not the only one. So. Yeah. Right, and we there, there, like, were, we were, there like, were some yeah. before you yeah. guys, and now there's there's been a bunch, and, yeah. and I don't know what the timing was, but the NBA is absolutely back down on yeah. mm -hmm. removing people. We from were like games. the second one. Um, I think a day earlier, the guy in LA had started his, and he was hugely successful. Yeah, And um, very supportive of us, And very too. supportive. So yeah, we worked together, we communicated with people within that group back and forth, and then we did the same for people that were trying to organize stuff in other cities. Yeah. So we were all just working together, trying to promote. Because it's again, it's not about us. We're trying to proliferate the message. Yeah. So if we could support someone in Houston or wherever, then more power to you. Here's the people we're using, and, and we'll please, give you the please artwork. go do it. You know, yeah. um, same thing with LA. They sent us the artwork if we wanted to use what they were doing. We actually handed out a couple to. boxes of their shirts too, because they had some that they brought up. Yeah, so. and you can see some of those in the yeah. video as well. Yeah. Yeah. The um, the 
the, the principle here, it reminds me of, of my old days of, of trying to pressure politicians to do the right thing. And you know, there was always that sort of naive hope that you could elect politicians who would do the right thing because it was the right thing to do. I th but that's not how it works. And I think the same is true with corporations. Same is true with the NBA. The same is true with any company, uh, frankly, public or private. They're, they're also susceptible to public opinion and grassroots pressure and, and being caught hypocritically not supporting what would be viewed as a fundamental universal value. Yeah. Freedom of association, freedom of speech, mm -hmm. uh, freedom to vote. Yeah. Like these, are, these aren't radical concepts in the United States. And I think, I think that's probably why the NBA had to back down. I'm also well, most disappointed yeah. in Nike. You know, Nike had this campaign about do something even if it means risking everything. Yeah. Um, with Colin Kaepernick. Yeah. And um, they basically seized the moment of a great marketing opportunity around Black Lives Matter. And um, the fact that they were very silent on this, you know, is, you know, it's seen by everyone. You know, I think that it's, uh, it's really, really sad that they only cherry pick uh, issues that help them, you know, sell sneakers. Um, but they had a chance to actually really shine. And I actually think that they, you know, I think a lot of their shoes aren't even manufactured in China. Yeah. Um, they've moved them to Korea and Vietnam, I Vietnam think. Vietnam and, and, and so I don't, I don't see why they didn't, you know, capture this moment because it would have fit nicely along with that campaign, which is, you know, we do care about these freedoms. We do care about people because that was all about people wearing shirts as well mm -hmm. and expressing themselves and taking a knee. Yeah. You know, because um, they were wearing their shirts pregame warm ups. Mm -hmm. um, supporting that cause. Yeah. Um, and those were the players doing it. So we we're actually trying yeah. to get some of the players to wear shirts too, and they didn't really respond. No. <laughs> well, the, try. <laughs> the, the good news or the bad news is that this fight's not over. Yeah. And, and we're going to need a lot more participation amongst uh, consumers and companies. And even in the case of, uh, you know, you had one of the few bipartisan pieces of legislation. Mm -hmm. Usually when something passes on a bipartisan and almost universal basis, I'm like, what did they do to us now? Yeah. <laughs> but this one is pretty good and it's also symbolic, a yeah. symbolic statement of, of support for the Hong Kong people that uh, Democratic House, Republican Senate, Republican president signed. And I was, I was caught off guard, to be honest. Um, of course. I think these things are related yeah. and it wasn't just that one night that you guys did it, yeah. it's it's all of this combined. Oh, for sure. It made it impossible for Congress. Well, not and there to were say impassioned something. speech from our representatives as well. Yeah. Um, that were on the floor trying to get these bills passed. I mean, it, it's just the right thing to do. Yeah. Um, but I was kind of surprised that that Trump ended up signing it. To be honest, um, I thought that he might try to scuttle it, um, just in for the sake of his um, Chinese trade talk. Yeah. But Fortunately, he used it obviously as a leverage, uh, leverage play. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't know. I don't know if he would have wanted to do it, but he did it. He did it, and we don't need to second guess why he did no. it because it's just it's, great that he. It's did. a very important thing. And to your earlier point, um, it's pretty amazing to see a bunch of activists who, by the way, are risking their lives. They're risking going to jail. They're risking um, getting shipped back to mainland China and disappearing. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not a. It's not a cavalier decision they make when they go out into the streets, but they're waving American flags saying, thank you, President Trump. Well, yeah. even here when, with our volunteers, a lot of them have family back in Hong Kong and in China, and they were wearing masks helping us out. Right. Um, and a lot of Americans even in the city don't understand why. Yeah, they're like, why are they wearing masks? Can't um, they take those off? And we're like, no, they can't. Right. Like their, their family's they, lives will be in danger. Because their activism here can put their family in danger over there. And yeah. a couple of them had told me that they recognized some of the people from the consulate that were actually taking pictures of everybody there. So yeah. it, that's what the government does over in China. That's what yeah. CCP does. That's why it's so dangerous. Well, I think that, uh, you know, I really wish people would give Trump credit when he actually deserves it. Um, because, you know, that, I do feel like he is driven a lot by public sentiment uh -huh. and he loves to be adored. And so when he does something right, um, you know, I, I actually tweeted, you know, uh, thank you, President Trump, which is the first time I've ever thanked him publicly for anything. And, you know, I think that we could actually get him to do more positive things like this right. if we actually were more vocal. Yeah. And so I know people, you know, are, are divided on President Trump, but like, I think that Whenever he does anything that furthers liberty in the world or at home, 
you know, I think that we should commend those efforts, including commuting sentences for people, et cetera. And, you know, because if he gets that message, especially from a bipartisan sort of, you know, groundswell, yeah. then he's going to do more of it. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's like, honestly, every elected official is like that, good, bad, or ugly. They, they respond to um, public opinion. And if you can, if you can be president and come up with win-win scenarios, um, mm -hmm. Who says no to that? Yeah, right. Well, and I mean, that's, and, by and that's our job yeah. is to make it a winning issue for him. I mean, our country was founded on bipartisanship. They had yeah. to agree on the founding and, and the wording of our uh, founding documents and everything. Um, so that should ultimately be the goal. Um, not everybody gets what they want. Even if you don't like Trump, again, like Cyan is saying, when he does do something like this, you should say thank you. Yeah. Shower him with support. Yeah, because I mean, <laughs> there are things that we can all agree upon, and one of those things is just human rights. Yeah. Uh, it's not. A, it's not a partisan issue. It's not and a they won't issue. even do the right thing because they hate him. Yeah. yeah, it's not a partisan issue at all. You know, Van Jones has talked about that. Van Jones, of course, the very progressive uh, criminal justice activist, someone that I've worked with on this very same thing. And when I was a Tea Party leader, I happily went into the Obama Justice Department to meet with Eric Holder um, because we agreed on the thing that needed to be done. And I don't think it's a partisan thing, but, but Van Jones took a lot of heat for working with Trump on mm -hmm. what everyone agrees was a good first step. It's called the first step, but uh, on criminal justice reform. Um, but I, I want to take a step back to the video because the other piece of this story is like we're using a pop culture hook basketball, big in the United States, even bigger perhaps in China. The Chinese people love the NBA, which is why it's such a leveraged point that we talk about. But, but this isn't about basketball and it's about the right to play basketball. It's about um, some, some fundamental human rights. And you, you were saying earlier that people don't even know, know why they wear the masks mm -hmm. because the government will jail them and, and target their families. and and these kinds of things. And that sounds fantastical to people that haven't been paying to China. But I wanted to read a quote from, from October of this year because I read it to the um, uh, Lee, not, not you, Lee, but Lee in the video. She's a, she's a Chinese expat who grew mm -hmm. up under Mao. So she knows a little bit about what this is about. And Simon is, is a free market activist who started something called the, the, the Lion Rock Institute in Hong Kong as he saw the protesters emerge and as he saw the Chinese government starting to break the promise of, of autonomy for Hong Kong. Um, and this is what they're fighting about. And this is from the BBC, Hong Kong protest. President Xi warns of bodies smashed. And he said this in public, anyone who attempts to split any region from China will perish with their bodies smashed and bones ground to powder. And it's, it's hard to imagine that anyone who's president of any country saying that publicly, I can imagine plenty of them saying it privately, but um, that's what this is about. Yeah. When you have no reason to have accountability, you just have free reign to do whatever you want, then you can make statements like that. Yeah. No other leader in a free world, a free world nation can make a statement like that. It's just atrocious and ridiculous. Yeah. But the, this article goes on to speculate that he can't actually do it because there's too many eyeballs on him right now. And that's the, so the more eyeballs we can get on people and the, and the more Americans appreciate why they wear masks because of surveillance and because of, of very violent oppression. And, and the other piece of this, when I read that quote, I'm like, that, that reminds me of an article I read just recently about the Tiananmen Square massacre in 2017 a um, newly released um, secret diplomatic cable um, from then British ambassador to China um, was revealed last year. And this, this diplomat is quoting a member of the Chinese government about what actually happened in Tiananmen, Tian, Tiananmen Square. Um, just, just so people appreciate what's happening. Um, and I'll read from the memo. Students linked arms but were mown down, including soldiers. APCs then ran over bodies time and again to make a pie, and the remains were collected by a bulldozer, incinerated and then hosed down the drains. This is the Chinese government 
targeting Let's students. Remind people when this happened. Oh, this was 1989. Right. And, so uh, we're not talking about ancient history here. Yeah. And this is scrubbed from the internet and from their teachings in their own country. So if you live in China, you often think Tiananmen Square didn't even happen. Yeah. But Tiananmen Square is very much the symbolic North Star for the activists in Hong Kong. And I've read all of these really depressing stories where they're exhausted. They've been doing this for six months. They've seen their friends shot. They've, they've seen their friends disappeared. But they're like, if we don't win, we're dead anyway. Mm -hmm. And that was the quote. So not, not a small thing, but, but I believe, and this, you know, I, I, I suppose I have to believe this, but I, I really do believe that, that um, corporate pressure and consumer pressure and public opinion and newspapers, these are all things that constrain China's behavior in a way that, that you couldn't have imagined even a couple of years ago. Yeah, we've been seeing slower economic growth in China too because of this. Yeah. We have corporations and nations that are deciding to pull their supply chains out of China, moving into other, other Asian countries um, yeah. to decrease the dependence on China. And also just because of the trade, trade uh, issues between the US and, and what sort of leverage we have over the Chinese markets. Yeah. Because again, like I was saying earlier, the financial markets flow through Hong Kong. So if we're controlling that and Make no mistake about it. All the things that you buy here in America, you are essentially funding the regime of CCP uh, over in China, the Chinese government. Um, so we have to hold our corporations accountable for that. Um, they need to make, just for the stakeholders, they need to make better, well-informed decisions on what they do and who they want to do business with. Because it's our money that is funding this sort of oppression. I used to be pro-buying things from China um, because I do believe that you know, as people become wealthier and have economic freedom, then freedom comes along with that as well. So, like, this is not about Chinese people. Mm -hmm. It's about the CCP. Yeah. And so, like, I don't want to punish people for their government. Um, unfortunately, that will be the, the end game, um, especially if we start to boycott uh, China and, and companies that are operating out of there. You know, one of the things that is... One of the reasons why they wear these masks, by the way, is because of um, AI facial recognition. Yeah. And so China is the leader in the world when it comes to this. And so they have a whole social credit system that's based off of your behaviors. Um, like there was a case that I read recently where a woman had um, facial reconstructive surgery done and she was unable to transact and get any sort of money out of her bank um, because her nose was altered. I mean, this is like how how they, they govern their people. And um, they also catch criminals this way. Uh, and crime is not necessarily what we define as crime, because sure. you thought crime. Yeah. Um, so I think that one of the things we can do is, is be conscientious of the types of businesses we are doing business with. Like TikTok scares the crap out of me. Um, like I often wonder, like what is it that they want with a corpus of our children's data you know, like, because obviously they're scanning and, and analyzing faces. Yeah. And if people say, well, TikTok's a separate entity, that's not true either, because every single Chinese-based company has the government involved in, you know, there's there's censors, there's, you know, government officials that sit at in the buildings of these companies. And sometimes they're even direct investors. And so they have information rights and control over these companies. And then something interesting that I found out about recently is that a Chinese company bought Grindr. Um, this is really concerning. So if you think about Grindr is the number one network in the world for, for gay men to hook up. Um, and, you know, they now have access to a world corpus of, you know, pictures and torsos and faces and profiles of gay men hooking up. Yeah. What could they do with that? Um, it could be atrocious. And so I, I really do think we, um, we need to be more mindful of of what we do there, because I do think that we have given up um, a lot of freedom and in exchange for cheap goods. Yeah. And so we need to stop doing that. So I, I like to draw a distinction between consumer boycotts and, and, and buying things with, with a social awareness of, of, of the values that you support versus sort of an arbitrary government. Um, it's not a boycott. What do you, what do, uh, embargo? Like I, I'm, I don't, I don't want the government to make this decision. I want people to make this decision. That's the ideal situation. Yeah. yeah. But the people also have to be informed as yeah. to why. And they yeah. have to know the impact of their spending dollar. 
And so if they can know and, and have tied the correlation to their products that they're buying from so-and-so company to what uh, is enriching the CCP and allowing them to oppress people, then I think it'll have a greater impact. Well, there's, I mean, there's a number of tech companies that are also um, sort of uh, kowtowing to the Chinese government Google. as well. Google's one of them. For a long time, Google didn't, wasn't going to operate in China because of these um, human rights violations. Yeah. But they won't even do defense contracts for our own country, but instead we'll go and do AI research for China. You know, it's. Um, and again, like Cyan was saying, if you're doing anything in China, the government and the military has access to it. Yeah. They're mm -hmm. required to have backdoor and, and basically administrative access to it. Yeah. Hollywood, that's another big one. So um, I recently met an actress who had a a movie that just came out and she went there on a press junket and um, they asked her who her favorite Chinese actors were and she you know had studied before the interview and, and rambled off a couple and they're like oh no nope cut don't say those names they're out of favor with the government and so these are the names you're gonna say yeah and she was like but I don't like them I don't know who they are like I'm not saying that and they're like no you will say that and so she was coached to say these names and then um, she wasn't allowed to criticize the air quality of Beijing. And so she said, uh, it's polluted here. And they're like, it's not polluted. You can't say that. You can't say polluted. You know, and so, and she was just like, why do we go there? And why do we, why are we so desperate yeah. for, for market share and money? And not only that, but they censor our movies. So if we want to say anything about China, um, about what's going on there, you know, they won't give distribution to that movie if it has any sort of negative impact yeah. on how they're perceived. And this is a relatively new phenomenon, even with movies too, because previously, um, before Xi Jinping, um, and also like around 2000 or so, they would still get American movies there. They wouldn't be able to censor them, but they could pick which ones they wanted to air. And if that is access to the market, great. But we are actively seeing Hollywood studios yeah, countdown. Altering scripts. Changing scripts. Changing scripts before movies are even made, just to making sure that they have a prominent, like one of their favorite Chinese actors or actresses in the movie. So they actively do that. Or MIB, or was yeah the recent MIB movie, Men in Black. Um, you go into the little hall, and now you hear Chinese speaking over the head, like over the intercom inside. So you uh, you see this influence going on, and those movies were funded by Tencent. Yeah. And you was, can't have like gay characters, can't have gay kisses or anything in the movies. It's ridiculous. So I was, I was pleasantly surprised to see Quentin Tarantino, who was asked to censor, what, what's the movie called? Once Upon a Once Time, Time in Hollywood. Hollywood. Yeah. Great, great movie. He refused to do it. And it seemed, it almost seemed, it seemed like a fairly petty nitpicking. They, they didn't like the way that he portrayed Bruce Lee. Yeah. Oh, geez. Okay. And so I'm like, this is not a threat to, to Chinese uh, yeah. control of, of their people. But um, he had enough juice and enough wealth to just say no. Uh, but I would imagine that most people that work in Hollywood don't have the clout to say no to their, to their masters. I think, it was, a, I think yeah. it was the same thing with Zhang, Django Unchained when that went over to China. And he refused to censor it as well. And yeah. then China, the Chinese government finally buckled and allowed it into the, to the country. But by that time, it had been pirated so much then the movie only made like a million dollars. Yeah. So, so the, the, since, since we're going along this, this cultural path, I, I think holding these, these American mega companies accountable, I call mm -hmm. Hollywood a company, even though it's three. I don't, I don't know how many peop, people work in Hollywood, but, um, this, this accountability has to be bottom up. Like, I don't, I don't think there's a law we can pass. I don't think a presidential proclamation as powerful as it is symbolically, that's not gonna solve this problem. It has to be public awareness. Yeah, don't watch their movies. Yeah. You know, um, unless you absolutely have to. <laughs> like, you can, you can avoid a lot of these movies. Um, the other thing is that you can you know, Twitter is open and these actors and actresses and producers are on Twitter and they're listening. So, you know, if people, they adapt. Like if you look at all of the movies that are coming out, they're like rehashes of movies, but recast with women, mm -hmm. you know? And, um, and that's because of public discourse. Like they, they had to do that in order to appease an audience. Um, and so this is the same thing, which is, you know, Hollywood lacks diversity of thought. And, you know, they, 
people are so afraid there to have any sort of political leanings that or any ideas that don't fit like what everyone else believes. And but that's not reality. Like everyone, you know, even this actress I was talking to said, I'm afraid to even come out and say these things because I might not be cast in another movie or I my, my career could be over. Yeah. So these types of ideas could be career ending. Um, Tarantino is at the top of his game and can do whatever he wants. But if you're an aspiring you know, director or producer or actress, actor, you, you can't do that. So what we need to do is encourage that kind of behavior and that sort of dissent um, that we've seen in the Me Too movement, et cetera. To make it safe, right? Make it safe. Yeah. Make it safe to say, you know, I don't, I don't agree with this. Yeah. And, you know, um, and the studios will have to listen. And it's okay to disagree with people. You're not going to die if somebody has yeah. a different opinion. Um, but there are situations in San Francisco and business or even in Hollywood to where you have this sort of totalitarian view. Of if you, you don't agree with us, you're not one of us, you're not going to join us. You're not a culture fit, etc. Yeah. Well, yeah. think about Atlanta and you know, the, the movie industry. Uh, a lot of people said we're not going to film in Atlanta um, or in the South um, due to... In Georgia for the abortion. Uh, abortion as well as um, the there's bathrooms. the bathrooms, right? And so like if suddenly a bunch of people were just like, oh, we're not going to give you money or film there anymore. You know, if they're willing to do that, then why can't they stand up for yeah. millions of people's human rights? Right. Yeah. You know, and so it's clear that they can do it when it when it makes sense for them. Um, well, I, I think they like on this issue, and they, these are these are like core human values that I don't consider either right or left. And and there are people on the right and the left that don't apparently still believe in free speech and freedom of association and, and assembly and those kind of things, but. I think, you know, the story you told earlier about people sort of nervously seeing your, your T-shirts inside an NBA mm -hmm. game. And these are people that probably spent a fortune to be in the special oh, yeah. uh, reception yeah. room b before they go down to their courtside seats. They were afraid to say, that's awesome, right? Mm -hmm. Until and, it was turned around. And then they, and then and they then were they, worried. And then they, but they come up and they whisper to you. That actually happened. I don't, you remember that, that Bill Maher show that I did years ago? Where, where you and, and a couple of your buddies were in the audience, yeah. and we were at a reception afterwards, and um, three times one of Bill Maher's staffers came up, like a production guy, and then, then someone that, that sort of managed the, the show, and looked around and whispered in my ear, I love what you're doing, man. They were scared to death. To actually it's, say it. <laughs> so some, someone's got to sort of break the, the ice, break mm -hmm. up the cartel. And let them know it's And okay. make it safe to sort of speak your mind on this stuff because this, it's, it's human nature, it's business. Like there's, there's a way to, to get things headed in the right direction. Mm -hmm. We do need, uh, this is where actors and actresses in pop culture uh, have a very important part to play in this. You know, if Ashton Kutcher were to wake up tomorrow and suddenly take up you know, the free Hong Kong flag, yeah. it would basically let everyone else know it's okay to do, Yeah. you know, and we haven't seen that. As a matter of fact, uh, I don't want to name any names, but like when I went uh, to go sit on the court, I reached out to a lot of different people and, um, you know, they were like, oh, I'm busy washing my hair that night. I <laughs> uh, would love to do it, but can't, you know, um, you know, or so-and-so would get mad at me or this could have repercussions in my career, et cetera. And so we don't, we haven't seen any, have you seen any celebrities actually take this up? Uh, no, I, I, no, I can't recall, just mostly politicians. Yeah, like so Ted, Ted Cruz. Cruz, I mean, Ted Cruz uh, surprised a lot of people because he Marco actually went there in Marco person. Rubio. I don't and know if Marco Rubio went in person, but he's another. Oh, I didn't, I didn't know Ted Cruz went. He went in person. Yeah, yeah he flew there to see it with his own eyes. And, um, you know, they were incredibly appreciative yeah, good that for him. he did that. And, and that's what we need. We need, you know, politicians are great, but, you know, Will Smith would be even better. <laughs> It'd yeah. be, uh, because again, like you said, it just, it makes people comfortable that what they believe is the truth. Have you ever been in an audience and you're afraid to ask a question because you're like, oh, my question's so stupid, you know? And then somebody gets up on the mic and asks the question you've been trying to ask. Right. And then everybody's like, that's a smart question. And you're like, darn it. That's kind of what's going on right now. There's a lot of people sitting there twiddling their thumbs saying, gosh, I really should say something. It really should, but someone's just got to stick their neck out there and well, do that's, it. Well, that's it's kind of Saul Alinsky 101. The first person that that steps out there defines the story, mm -hmm. defines the message, and and people that weren't sure what to think, all of a sudden they're like, yeah, that's that's right, and someone just needs to articulate it 
Unfortunately, Kanye's got a pretty full plate right now. So. Yeah, he's probably not the right person um, <laughs> right now. Uh, he's the right person for lots of other things, but probably not yeah. that. Um, being in the venture capital world, I've had a lot of VCs reach out to me. So this is also an interesting area of conflict. There's a lot of firms that have taken money from China. Um, right around the time of the sort of the rise of Bitcoin, um, a bunch of Chinese investors came over to the U.S. and started deploying hundreds of millions of dollars into companies and venture firms um, as a way of like parking money and keeping it safe. And so I think there's a lot of people who are also conflicted here, which is like, you know, if I admit that this is wrong, I also have to admit I took money from China. Um, they can do both of those things. Like you, they took the money from China and they can still say it's wrong. Yeah. Um, but for whatever reason, we're not seeing, you know, um, at least public support. I've been getting private support about what we've been doing. And so people have been giving us lots of high fives. We got a lot of donations from that community too. Um, but they're afraid to be public about it. Yeah, so there are a lot of anonymous donations for that. Yeah. 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 So we need people bigger than ourselves. You know, uh, this is a start. And like you said, it's mimetic and people copy it. We want it copied. You know, the more people who are willing to stick their necks out there means that it makes it safe for everybody else to do yeah. it. Which, which gets us, this is a, probably a, a great place to wrap up because that's precisely what this video is trying to do. And, and this, is, this, this show is the official launch for something that we want a lot of people to see. I want it, I want it to get to Hong Kong. Um, uh, some of my Chinese expat friends, friends are gonna try to get it in deep into that community and we'll try to get past the Great Wall of China. But if people care, politicians and corporations and even dictators could follow. That's mm -hmm. my theory. I just think that the public needs to be reminded that they're the ones ultimately in control whether it be in politics or within business. With politicians, you vote for your, your politician. You have the control of the vote. With finished goods, consumer goods, you vote with your dollar. So if you let these companies know that we're not gonna buy your product and this is why, we control your company, we control your revenue flow, we have the power and you're going to stand up for human rights, then that will go a long way because ultimately the people have the power they yeah, might, use they might culture not, for good. They may not understand how powerful they are, but if we remind them and let them know how powerful they are, then I think we can see some positive action. Yeah. Yeah, we already have this, uh, it's even called cancel culture. You know, people get outraged over everything. Um, you know, they just need to get outraged over this. And, uh, and that will actually start to move the needle. You know, I think that uh, you're more gentle than I am. So get get outraged about something that really, really, really matters. Really yeah. matters. Yeah. yeah, that really matters. And and if people think they can't do anything and they have they're powerless, I mean, I felt that way too. Like we both felt that way. We're like we feel so powerless in this situation. Like what can we do? And that's why we did what we did. You know. And if there's all it takes is a few thousand people like our ourselves and to I'm go a nobody. and do it. And I'm a nobody. It just takes determination. I mean, when we were starting the, the, the GoFundMe um, project, people were messaging. They weren't sure who I was or if it was a scam. But then when they saw Cyan, they're like, okay, we, we can get behind that. We know it's not a scam. Yeah. But it's just, you have to get used, people have to get familiar with that. It's like being, standing up for human rights is not something, re you know, reserved for a certain class of people or for celebrities. I mean, anybody can get involved. Right. And so, again, it goes back to how powerful in, end users and consumers can be. Yeah. Look cool. what a difference. He's a squirrel hunter from Arkansas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just a hillbilly from did. the mountains and came down out of the mountains, mountains, mountains to San Francisco. <laughs> so do you, do you wear that hat out in public in San Francisco? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I wear it all the time. He wears it for that reason. I wear it for that specific reason. I've been a gun owner since I was about this tall, but when I came here to San Francisco and just recently with the city council declaring that gun owners are terrorists, essentially domestic terrorists, and the NRA is domestic terrorist group, um, I just started wearing this hat everywhere I go. Yeah. And I get, it's been beautiful. I get nothing. <laughs> no one says art. anything to me about it. I don't know why. <laughs> it's a mystery. We make a lot of uh, personal safety arguments about, about gun ownership. Um, and I, I've shied away from sort of the philosophical libertarian argument that I need the right to bear arms because someday the government might try to take me out. And Normally, people's eyes roll and they're like, oh, oh this are one of those yeah. crazy yeah. guys. And now I'm like, dude, Hong Kong. Yeah. yeah. And well, then you, you also have the argument here, oh, well, you can't stand against the military. Those are just civilian guns. You don't even need them. 
those aren't military guns. But then they, to argue against the guns, well, those are military guns. You don't need them. So they, they go back and forth on this argument. You can't stand up against the government with what you have, but you can because they're military weapons. So it's just totally dishonest. You know. Just looking back at our history, if you look at some of the standoffs we've had between the government and small groups of people and with guns, um, the small group of people with guns won both times that I can think of. Um, <laughs> and uh, partially just because they're so afraid to go in there. Yeah. And I'm not saying I agree with these people or what they were doing, but um, you know, it, it just shows like how powerful it can be. Um, so if you had a million out of seven million people with guns in Hong Kong, this would not be happening. Right. It never would have started. Nope, never would have started. Yeah. The government needs a little bit of fear of the people. So it has to be reminded that the people ultimately have the control. The okay. government should fear its people. Yeah. Someone, yeah. someone famous said that. Someone famous yeah, said that. Once upon a time, yeah. Yeah. Long, 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 <laughs> long ago. Okay, um, direct to camera, you guys got to check out the video. It's uh, very cleverly called Free Hong Kong, and you can find it at freethepeople.org. You can find, find it on our YouTube page. And if we do our job, you're going to find it everywhere. It's going to be so clogging up your Facebook feed that you're finally going to send Lee 50 bucks to print more shirts. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thanks <laughs> Thank for you. joining Thank me. you. Thank you. Thanks for watching Kibbe on Liberty. By now, you know this is the most important event of your week. So make sure you subscribe on YouTube. Click the little bell so you get notifications. Kibbe on Liberty, mostly honest conversations with mostly interesting people.